Hello everybody, uh, this is Vineet Devaya, uh, CEO and founder of teleportme.com and I'm welcoming you all to our second uh, live session uh, that is specifically for the groups of uh, 360 uh, uh, photography and also 3D capture uh, in the future. And uh, today is a very, uh, we have a very special guest, uh, someone who has spent a considerable amount of time doing research uh, on the, uh, you know, the feasibility of virtual tours as a marketing tool. And uh, I think it would be amazing to really talk to her, understand what her research is all about and, and kind of uh, understand for ourselves that we can um, use for educating our clients, educating our uh, community and, and creating a more sustainable business for us as well as our customers. Uh, so without further ado, I'm, I'm going to bring in Kelly Anderson, and uh, I hope we all have a great time. Hey, hey Kelly, how are you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Hey, no problem, no problem. Thanks for thanks for coming here and uh, taking your time uh, early in the morning. Uh, and I hear that uh, today is uh, is teaching day for you. <laughs> That's right. Teach my students about media this afternoon, so it'll be fun. Awesome, awesome. So, so Kelly, I think uh, you know we uh, we have a huge audience that is waiting to hear from you about your research, and so I would let you just start off with uh, specifically, you know, kind of what your research thesis is about, uh, and and kind of take it from there. Sure. So I know you wanted to also uh, just to give a little bit of background on me. I am a doctoral candidate, which means I am about to get a job and, and start with a PhD on the end of my name. But I actually have 15 years of industry experience, uh, predominantly in CRM and consumer insights coming in before I started my doctoral study. But I actually had this really unique experience. Um, just before starting my, my PhD um, of selling my house and selling my house where, of course, I hired a marketing oriented real estate agent who happened to use 3D tours. And I'd never seen the product before. I was, as a marketer, blown away by the capability. I found I was even doing unique things that I was is not usual for my behavior in selling homes um, and having sold homes before that seemed really odd for me. So I guess you could say that really piqued my interest as a side project um, to start looking at MLS data. And so looking wow. at multiple list service real estate data to see if, if this really did help sell the house faster and for more money. And that's how it got started. And my, dissertation work from there on just sort of snowballed. So awesome. my research at high level really talks about emerging technology, but right now predominantly in the VR tour or 3D tour um, area and looking at it from a systems perspective, understanding how it's impacting both consumers as well as how we build markets. And then looking at that related to brand and consumer identity. So in a nutshell, that's that's what I study. That's awesome. That's awesome. I think MLS is the the mother load of uh, real estate data. So I think that's a great place to to kind of come up. And, and we have a lot of people uh, tuned in, you know, I mean, we have Joachim, who is from uh, Norway. Uh, Joachim, hi. I think uh, I think I can do this here, which is pretty cool. There you go. And uh, we have Sean, um, we have Matt. Uh, so we got a lot of people, so that's good. We have Martina. Uh, so, hey guys, uh, thanks for tuning in. And, and uh, you know, so let's, let me ask you some hard hitting questions on the real crux of what people are here to, here to find out. So I think uh, the important part really is that uh, you looked at MLS data and uh, from your research, it's about 125,000, somewhere around there, and you came up with some insights. So please share with us the insights and a little bit about the methodology so that people understand uh, where you're coming from and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah absolutely. 
So the study actually started with a data set from 2016 to 2017 in a southern market. And that was actually only a little over 18,000 listings. Um, but we were able to uncover through multiple regression analysis where we did a number of different layers controlling for those property factors. So things like the square footage of the home, number of bedrooms, bathrooms, whether at a pool or not trying to at least control for as many of those factors as we could and really trying to understand if this did in fact increase the purchase price of the home and decrease the days in the market. And what we found is it in fact did. And what was really interesting in this initial study is that we also did interaction effects because as marketers, of course, we want to know when we add something new, what is it doing to my old marketing? Yep. So how does it change? Exactly. And so what we found comparative to a similar market in the South is from 10 years before a similar study. So VR or VR tours, 3D tours certainly did move the needle. So did photographs to some degree, but video, not so much. And so. Oh, we interesting. Saw, yeah, we actually saw that this actually seemed to be. Um, a radical marketing mechanism in this market. Uh, and really that's that's found, you know, that's hugely impactful if we're trying to understand what the potential is for VR and what it's going to do in the real estate market. But this was just one market, right? So you said which place is this in the south? It's in a southern market. So I'm not really names. Oh, sorry, but, southern market, sorry. <laughs> you're good, you're good. I know the academic business is crazy um so yeah we we wanted to expand this study and look at it at other geographically diverse looking at different types of cities and how is it doing in other areas so we ended up being able to grab some data from about 2017 to 2019 and three other markets across the United States from MLS data, a multiple listing service, and replicated this study. So again, multiple regression, same control factors, controlling for days on the market when we're looking at purchase price and vice versa. Um, and for sales price, the results were consistent. So in that study, which was 125,000 you mentioned earlier, almost 127, um, that was consistent about four to 8% of the homes, or I should say of the homes in that market, the average home, it increased the purchase price by four to 8%. Wow. So, and do you have a rough idea what the average price of a house was so that you, know, you can put a number? Yeah, I mean, it really depended on the market. That's what's kind of interesting because these were various markets, of course, um, and they ranged. So we had some where the average purchase price was about 240 and others that were up to 480. Um, wow. So not, we're not talking like the New Yorks, right? But we're talking about good average American metro markets um, that still are ranging in their price points. Right. I mean, I mean, still, I mean, 5% is, and is, is, is that is, is almost your brokerage fee, right? Or, or double your brokerage fee. So I think right. that, that that's pretty interesting. And, and just for people, I think there are a lot of people probably who are not from the US. Uh, the MLS listings are kind of the open sourced, uh, I mean, I don't know if open source is really the right word, but basically all the buying and selling of houses goes into this massive database in the US. Uh, there everything, you know, price, uh, you know, space, uh, photographs, and everything is, it's kind of like an easily searchable database. And, uh, you know, uh, researchers like Kelly, I, do you have free, do you get free access to it or do you have to pay for access? Yeah, it's interesting in the United States, and I've honestly tried to get similar data out of the country as well. So if you happen to know anybody, let me know. <laughs> my way we'd love to crank through the data um, but what's uh, interesting in the US is it's very regionally oriented so it depends on the region some mm. actually do you have to pay for it as a student I was able to get um, get some of that access for free or dis discounted and then others actually if if they know it's for educational and academic purposes that has been very fortunate that they're willing to work with us on that Awesome. So, so you got access to all of this data and then you, you've kind of just 
uh, what regression analysis is, you know, kind of in, in, in non-academic work, work. It's just basically like uh, taking factors in and out of a comparison, right? Basically just to like really dump it down. And, right. and, and, and when you looked at it, you saw that the, the, the videos performed the lowest. Is that what you're trying to say? Like out of the photos, the virtual tours and the videos, the impact of the videos was the lowest. Is that? That's really market dependent. And it's very, market. yeah, because even when we're looking at days on the market in one of the markets, the Midwest market, day, uh, days on the market for VR and for video actually flipped. And I think it's just because they're not using it very much and it's it. uh, used for those properties that they have to sell. They've been on the market for a while. So I think there's a, other variables, of course, at stake we can't control for with this analysis. Yeah. It's, it's um, yeah. yeah, but, you know, purchase price, seeing the effects on purchase price, which honestly, from an academic standpoint with the statistics, the R squared was so much higher. So we're feeling much more confident versus days on the market is a little hard to pin down. Right. But this price actually has been pretty, pretty uh, clever. And I see Martin's question. Oh, you, you can see the comments, too. Oh, yeah. there you go. OK, that's great. That's great. That, that, so I was <laughs> so just just. Uh, you know, all, all you know, all tips on the table. This is a new software that I'm trying out, so a lot of new things here. Um, so I think uh, let let me put up this question here from from Martin Gordy Fairburn. Will all this data be put up in a graph or chart? Yes. So what I do have available on my website, which I'm sure that can be shared afterwards, is I do have a link to at least the summary that has those high level statistics. It's nothing major and deep. Obviously, that data is held uh, for the MLS uh, boards that actually participated, as well as for honestly, we're still working through drafts and getting this published. So once that's published, then it'll be fully accessible to everyone. There are some conference papers where there's more information. You can find that on my website as well. Um, but in addition to that, I wanted to share with you guys, we're, this is still a work in progress. And what we're doing now is we're actually doing some econometric modeling, which is actually going to help to clean up any of that neighborhood um, messiness. As if you've ever been in real estate, right. you know, right? Like it's very neighborhood oriented. So that's very, actually- Especially in the US, I think. I think the US is a little bit more neighborhood focused than most countries because us has a dependency on the school so depending on your school district you know if the prices of your, your your apartments kind of move that way so you're right about that and, and i think you told something again i think this is academic talk you talked about r square so if you can just if you can talk if you can dump that down to kind of yeah. i think that means like the statistically relevant result that's what it, it would mean yeah. right yeah, it actually refers to for the model itself, it talks about R squared is the percentage of that DV, so the dependent variable of purchase price being dependent on those other variables. Other variables yes. Mm -hmm. so, so, so I think so to, of all the all the research you did, the the main part that you could really kind of as a as a researcher with all conscience could, could actually pinpoint and say that virtual tours could increase the market sales price by four to eight percent right and i think that that is you know i mean i'm sure people in this group are just gonna like put it on this massive paper and send it to all their customers because i think that that is that is that is pretty incredible uh numbers and you know if anybody wants to read more about kelly's uh research it is the the link is is in the event description it's kellyanderson.com no I'll, I'll send I'll send the I'll send the link uh, later on, but it's there, uh, and uh, you every it's there in the event description, so they can just go click on it and, and see there. Uh, I think the the next thing, Kelly, I really wanted to ask you is about real estate. You know, uh, have you looked at different kinds of virtual tours? Because I think most of your research has been Matterport. Uh, you know, but uh, have you looked at you know difference between Matterport or other stuff? Because I, I would be surprised if you could do that, if you could differentiate that in the MLS data, because I don't think the MLS data differentiates between Matterport and other virtual tours. So this, yeah, carry on. Good question. And I'm going to be the horrible person have to go grab my charger too, because of course I had to move my computer, but forgot to bring the charger. But no um, to your question though, as far as 
different v virtual tours. Um, you know, it was a, a good effort to try to even differentiate the videos from the virtual or, or uh, more 3D tours. So that, unfortunately, we don't have the ability to go further than that in the MLS, to your point. So we right. don't have capability. We have not um, done, we've had some conversations about potentially breaking that out between different types of providers, um, but I don't unfortunately have any analysis on on that um, right. as far as effectiveness. So, so I'll, 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 I'll let you go get the charger where I talk about the information I have about MLS and virtual tours. Uh, Perfect. Yeah, so uh, I think by the time Kelly goes, gets her charger, uh, I think the kind of uh, overlying aspect is that virtual tours definitely increase the sales price uh, with her research, and I know this because I work with a couple of real, real estate companies that use our software, it is very difficult to distinguish within the MLS data what kind of software is being used. And I for sure know that more than more than 50% of the virtual tours that exist in the MLS data are non matterport uh, virtual tours. So this is basically working with, so for example, Zillow is our client. We work with Zillow, so they, they give us this kind of information. And so... I think that this is really important data, and uh, I'm gonna once Kelly is ready, I can see her. I think she's ready. Uh, I'm gonna bring her in, and we're gonna talk about uh, sort of the other markets that virtual tools are being used for, and, and maybe some other aspects of her research. Hey, Kelly. Thanks for welcome back. <laughs> there you go. You know, the, the one th the one good and bad thing about live is that it's all live. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, so Kelly, uh, uh, tell us more about, uh, I think that you have started kind of a very preliminary uh, work on rental market. So I would love to hear about that, that kind of study and the methodology that you're using there. Yeah, absolutely. So we have done some experimental or what we call quasi-experimental because of the way that the analysis works. But what we're doing is we're comparing photographs to the 3D or VR tours um, in different property areas. So of course, real estate, that of course, being the first starter, it really started with qualitative work going into there to help in our understanding that potentially it looks, it appeared from the qualitative work that it wasn't just something where consumers were just immersed and they're sold. Right. But sometimes they don't even have to look at the tour for very long, but it ends up being a signal that the product itself or the home is of higher quality. Ah. Um, ended up going in and testing that photographs versus the 3D tour in real estate, but also with apartment rentals and vacation rentals. Got it. So so it, it, you haven't gotten to the, the nitty gritty yet, but you, you kind of are looking at. And you can you can kind of make an assumption that it is an indication that this is a, a you know a more reliable vacation rental because you know when you're going on a vacation you can't really you know with, with real estate you can actually go to your neighborhood maybe look at the stuff and come back whereas vacation you know you need to be very sure uh, that this is what they show and I think with 360 tours because you can see the entire space there's no trick photography, uh, it, it kind of really should give you, like I said, the indication or uh, I, I forgot what the right word to use, but um, kind of the, it's a tangential uh, uh, thing towards, you know, hiring, high, increase convert. sorry. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. so, it, so is, is there a difference between vacation rentals and apartment rentals? Have you seen something different there or is it? Actually, it's consistent. So the model that I tested was consistent across th all three of those verticals. And so within the even the, the vacation rentals, we saw specifically when a consumer felt that the technology itself was more innovative. It was more likely that they felt that the home itself was a higher quality. And then therein, they were more interested in purchasing or renting the space. Got it, got it. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna there's a lot of questions coming, Kelly. You're, you're, you are a hit. Uh, so is there any specific question you would like to answer? If you can see them, I, would, I can just put them on once you tell me which one. Yeah. Um, 
Let's see. Well, we've got some Facebook users. I'm just going from the top and I shouldn't have. Um, so we did talk about using virtual tours with rentals. Um, the real estate limited to buy and sell segments or with real property businesses. Um, it is residential only is all I'm looking at currently, um, but so not. The, the question is that, uh, is it just buying and selling a rental or is it like kind of businesses? Right. So right now it's very consumer oriented. It is something I have a, a co-author out of Portland um, state. And so that's something that we've talked about as a future endeavor that we'd like to look into, but we uh, have not to date. Got it. Okay. Um, and then we have a question from Martina, which is um, the most important thing for customers, quality, of photos and a virtual tour, smooth transitions or other things. Is, is, have you had any chance to look at? qualitatively um, for the most part. And I think, you know, because I've, I've interviewed both photographers like yourself, as well as the consumers, as well as real estate agents in my dissertation work, it's predominantly more qualitative. Um, and I can tell you just from those interactions that, you know, a lot of times what happens when they're interacting with these tours is they're perceiving that the tour is much more ethical than other media, right? So photographs, especially since we tend to like to Photoshop these and um, have them look their best, it's not representative of the home. So you see the consumers that are actually using these tours and starting to rely on it. I actually start to question the merit of photographs. Um, uh, and that probably explains some of what we were seeing in the MLS data too, as photographs are just not as important as they maybe were 10 years ago. Um, so if they're willing to go through the tour, let's face it, there's a little more time um, engagement with the yeah. tour, that they're starting to question the merit of photographs. But as far as the smooth transition, things like that, of course they love that. I, at least qualitatively, I can certainly affirm yes. to yes. You know, they see that quality difference, um, probably more so than we like to, uh, to think. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I haven't quantitatively tested for that either. Got it, got it. So I think, I think kind of what you're trying to say is that just the existence of a virtual tour uh, hopefully well done, uh, will actually improve kind of the uh, perceived value of the place uh, and not necessarily, yeah, so I think I think that that was pretty clear. Um, all right, so so before we kind of move to more questions, uh, Kelly, I wanted to kind of explore the rental side a little bit more. Uh, can you, can you I, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add because I feel like there is a huge market and a huge market that's not been tapped in the rental space because uh, I, and I can speak this from our, our perspective. We work with a company called Nestaway.com, which is one of the largest rental uh, companies out of India, and they use our software to do it. And they have seen great uh, results. But the biggest problem they have is that with rentals or any kind of uh, sort of uh, listing-based quick decision-making, uh, 360 tours can be a deterrent because it takes a while to, to decide whether this is something you want to stick and spend more time on. You know, photographs are a better um, decision-making tool to kind of dig in, whereas 360 tools are not. So I don't know if that's something that you have thought about, mm -hmm. and, and I would love to know more about the methodology for the rentals itself. Yeah, this, this was truly an experiment where we split um, randomized individual groups, the samples, which we purchased uh, appropriate samples for those. And half of those individuals saw the VR tour and half of them saw the photographs. And so from there, they were asked a number of different questions. And what we saw is on the surface, it doesn't necessarily, you know, just because they observed the tour, just because they saw the photographs, that that increased their likelihood to per, uh, say that they would be interested in purchasing a rental. So that was that was across the board. So that's consistent whether it was real estate purchasing, um, where we surveyed buyers, um, you know, that were actually in the market and used to this type of technology, as well as those that are apartment dwellers. So 
we happen to have access to that here of students. So we talk to those, but, and also just apartment rentals, um, or I'm sorry, vacation rentals. So it did not on its surface on its own do that. The only mechanism that did that is their perception of the technology itself. Yeah. This was a, a project that was funded by Matterport. So we used that content. Um, so I can't say for the other content, but um, for that content, while that is the case, as long as the consumer perceives the technology as being innovative, and not everybody does, because there are those gamers out there that are like, well, this is, this yeah, is not this is, cool. This is 20 years old. Right. Yeah. Or you have an elder consumer who actually says, this is not, you, you know, this is not usable, right? They're not comfortable with this type of technology. Right. Um, so usually what we find, what I found in that data is when you're younger, a younger consumer tends to be a little more excited about it. Um, which you would kind of perceive the other. Maybe if you're older, you might perceive it to be more innovative. No, actually, if they're younger, they tend to be more excited about this technology. And that increases their innovativeness perception, their perception that this technology is novel. And then because it's novel, I think that the property, the rental property is going to be better. Now, from your, from your other question, though, as far as your, I think it's almost an emotive feeling, right? And that I pick up from the qualitative, just in general, not necessarily specific to rentals, but even I would say it would go into rentals that you feel more confident in your decision making, right? So if you're able to experience it in this 3D version, it's what I call, it's a virtual double, right? It's a digital double virtual twin of the space. Digital twin. Digital twin. Yeah. Um, well, this actually builds itself in a way where consumers are having a hard time even differentiating from the real versus the virtual space. There's negative consequences related to that from an academic standpoint, but what that does is it does enable them to feel fully confident in making their decision to purchase or rent the space. And then ultimately, any faults they find in the physical home, they end up blaming themselves. So they don't uh. blame they blame wow so that that is kind of like a human psychology thing because what you're doing what you're saying is we already gave you the virtual tour which is i give the i gave you all the information you had and the consumer if they are unhappy with the product they don't really blame the realtor or they don't blame the, the you know the person that owns the vacation rental they blame themselves because they were given all the information oh that's mm -hmm. that's very interesting and and uh, can you give a little bit more taste on how you figured that out? Like, is it just qualitative? Is it just like you ask people questions about it? Right. And you know, very few actually mentioned that they found there were differences between the physical and the digital. I found one informant, for instance, who actually works with VR technology. He blamed the technology. So that was a little bit unique. Um, the other informant that the example I'm sharing is she realized after purchasing the home that the shower trim was not what she thought it was. She thought it was going to be, you know, trimless shower stall and it happened to have the silver trim on it and she didn't love that um but she was also like but that was my fault she literally said that was my fault i didn't pay enough attention um and this is something that even theoretically we you know we we do concern ourselves with of you know when we start blending the digital with the real what happens in the consumer as a consumer's role, right? We're able to have a lot more agency in making these decisions as a consumer, but what kind of negative consequences are coming as a result? Well, there's a lot of work that you have to put in as a consumer yeah. to feel confident. Um, it's great, but there are negative consequences as well. Yeah, because that's exactly, I think, what I was trying to tell you is that they felt the research that they did was like, people felt like they had to do too much work to come to a, you know, to a conclusion of whether they wanted to rent or not rent. And I think maybe that's what kind of is similar to what you're talking about. Uh, moving away from kind of real estate buying, rentals, are there other industries that either you have looked at tangentially or have come across in your research that are uh, really good uh, sort of use cases for virtual tours or 3D tours? Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. I know we we chatted a little bit before about um, some research I'm about to do, but it's not there yet. But I know it's kind of exciting for you all. So I at least wanted to share um, one of the things we're about to start is investigating the potential for monetization for museums in this tour. I mean, we all know we're not able to go to museums right now. So how do we keep these typically governmental backed or even if not governmental backed nonprofit organizations afloat during this time? And so, you know, many have, I know from looking at boards, that's a big question, right? Like, well, how can I monetize this as a platform? So I don't, I won't answer the how you do it from a technical standpoint, but do we think it will work? And if it will work, what are some things we need to keep in mind? So that is an exciting project I'm working with a scholar in Norway on. Um, and so TBD on that, that'll be fun. Um, Maybe if we get it done within six to eight months, which is probably, yeah, we'll touch. probably we'll yeah, we will have a second session. Um, so right. before, before we carry on, uh, Kelly, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask people who are listening, uh, you know, this is a one hour thing and, you know, we're kind of at the half an hour mark. So start start leaving your questions and, and uh, you know, with 15 minutes left, we'll kind of start digging into some of the questions and, and answering them. Uh, I think there are some uh, some questions right here. Uh, is there anything that you would like to to answer? Yeah, Ross's first question there, any insight as to why virtual tours have not gained widespread momentum beyond residential real estate? And this was kind of this was interesting to me as well, because this is how I started um, the second portion of my dissertation work. And again, it's qualitative. Um, but of course, that means it was I actually took a socio historical analysis into the development of this type of technology. So starting back in 2008 and coding qualitatively, but coding for the differences and changes that have happened to this technology since then. And so um, what we see or what I have found is really, um, it might not answer your question exactly, but just to kind of give you the high level summary, what I have found is there are unique and interesting imagination practices that go into the process of actually expanding verticals. So going into those other different verticals beyond real estate. I was also curious because the way some of this technology started wasn't necessarily in real estate, but was more of a beta type of technology, right? So it was open, an open call to what works. Happened to be real estate was the one that was more institutionalized early on. And of course, um, you know, bringing in experts from real estate to help to build that is really what helped drive that. Getting that interest um, from those stakeholders was really important in trying to drive that. So I imagine that would probably need to happen, obviously, in other areas yeah, as well. But, you know, that comes with time. So even apartment rentals in the United States, apartments.com, you think about that, that's been institutionalized. My students all know about this technology because they've seen it for any time they've tried to rent an apartment. So once you gain that institutionalization, it makes it a lot easier. But what I'm finding is some really cool stuff. So part of what I was studying here is trying to understand not only how it developed, how it was potentially growing into other industries, which it has, right? But maybe not to the same degree as real estate. And then the potential futures of it. So what is the market future opportunity with this type of technology? We'll hold that for a moment. But what we're finding is a lot of the development, uh, the expansion that's happened to date is really based on consumer oriented entrepreneurs. So perhaps they have found um, a usage of the technology themselves. Uh, maybe they saw it in real estate, which is common. And then they said, well, wouldn't that be cool to do for a band promotion or to actually utilize it in a creative way, such as sticking it down manhole covers in Zimbabwe, right? So wow. is, that, is that a real use case? <laughs> That's a real case, yes. Wow. Wow. <laughs> um, so. And I've seen the breadth of potential there that's initiated by these creative entrepreneurs, basically. Consumers turned entrepreneurs in many cases, right? So 
many photographers I've even talked with, the VR photographers say, well, yeah, I came across it because I was looking for this or I happened to come across it as a consumer and then decided I wanted to use it as a business. So it's consumer turned entrepreneurs. But what you're getting at the heart of Ross is really how to get those verticals and industries to grow further. And that comes to institutionalization within those groups, which means bringing in experts um, from those industries to help and participate, which has been done to some degree, but it has to continue. And of course the consumer on the tail end thinking from a consumer perspective, has to be ready for it as well. Um, you know, in some verticals, it's just not, the, the readiness isn't there. It's maybe more novelty than, than actual utility. Um, and we've seen in past studies with VR, not mine, but in past studies that those can sometimes watch, wash each other out. So oh, just because wow. they're hedonically excited about this technology, if the technology is not useful, there's it just it doesn't make. Yeah, and I think I think this is this is kind of uh, maybe something that we are seeing now is you know I've been doing virtual tours for you know since 2009, and so I've been I've been in this industry for a while, and and I I remember the time where it was just exciting technology and people would you know kind of just get it because hey this is really cool we're going to put it up on our website and people are going to think we're really cool which is uh you know coming starting from what you were talking which is that they are impressed with the technology and they're impressed with the innovation and hence uh kind of associate that person that is showing the innovation as innovative and hence better right and so that's kind of how it was you know for the most part of the market and and kind of uh with 360 cameras, it became a little bit more accessible. And now with the pandemic, I think it's kind of really pushing it from a nice to have to a utility. And, and I think uh, that's, that's just an interesting, and you, you make a good point about, you know, entrepreneurs and consumer oriented entrepreneurs really kind of bringing, uh, taking a technology and, and kind of adding it to an idea they have to solve a problem that they have. Right. And I think uh, this group is, is filled with such entrepreneurs. I think uh, most of the people in this group are, are kind of small business owners, photographers, technologists who love 360 and 3D technology. So, uh, you know, just to answer your question, I think it was at Ross. I think it was Ross, right? Um, you know, I think maybe, you know, uh, people from this group are going to kind of help push uh, this industry forward and find interesting use cases because we all know real estate is, is a great use case but like things like museums you know and and coming up with a, a better use case of museum oriented tours than just a simple virtual tour would i think definitely add some value there um mm -hmm. so, so yeah i mean uh let me see is there anything else any other questions before is there anything that you would like to answer um asking about facebook user at 1005 asked uh, other niche markets, 1005 my time, sorry. Um, yeah, specifically related to healthcare clinics in Wisconsin. Yeah, I'm seeing documentation efforts, right? That, that's it. And even that's, that's a stakehold for sure. Anything that's B2B from an engineering standpoint, I think is still a great opportunity to pursue over time. That goes to the utility, anything construction. Sure, yep. it's, uh, documentation is a massive industry. It, it is it is not as lucrative uh, for small small players, but if you can get like a large construction company to give you a you know an annual contract to do uh, documentation for you, that that is definitely useful. And uh, I talk about this a lot with some of our 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 own customers of virtual tours uh, is kind of using it for government contracts. There are a lot of government contracts that mess that have a demand for 360 tours and that need to be done every six months to to maintain kind of safety and health protocols and so that's something that you know you need to kind of look at like local government tenders that you know are coming up and, and you'll definitely find something there so i think that's something that uh like i said documentation wise i think is, is a good it's a good add-on mm -hmm. kind of to build on that though too when you're thinking about consumer oriented it has to be more than utility um, we talk about utility, that that's a must, 
but excitement and novelty. It has to be more than just novelty. And what I have found with real estate specifically, what I think, um, at least what I'm arguing, is really driving the radical nature of this technology in real estate is its ability to create emotional uh, value. You know, creating connections, being able to have that emotional connection, being able to have that aesthetic value um, long term that really ends up creating new expectations within the real estate market. So that ends up being from especially from a consumer. And I would argue even for many B2B, it's going to ultimately get there. If the utility isn't enough, there has to be a function um, of the technology that can allow that. Many times as a tech provider, you don't know what that's going to be. You're right? I don't, you're absolutely, you're absolutely no idea. Yeah, you have no idea. Yeah. Right. And so you a lot know, of tech. Sorry, mm -hmm. I, I, just, I just I like to always give this example about augmented reality. You know, we as techies, we, we think of augmented reality as this new generation thing. And billions of people use augmented reality for face filters, you know, and, and you would never think about it. And you would never like if you had to put if you ask somebody what would be the largest use case of augmented reality, it would not be putting a cat face on a person. Right. That just would not be what you would think. And But the consumer uh, decides kind of where the technology goes. And, and yeah. And that consumer oriented entrepreneurship is what can drive it. It's just being able as a firm or as a tech firm, trying to identify those trends early on and trying to leverage some of those values and recognizing that there's potential there that's more than just utility. And I think that's that's really the key is identifying that sweet spot. And sometimes, many times, we don't know what that is. Got it. Okay, so I'm going to scroll to the... So more things for me, I, I can answer that later, but uh, I think Lewis has a good question. Yeah, that's a good one. So the the major question here um, is far, actually I'll answer the second one, which I think is cut off a little bit, but as far as how much time they're using compared to without it. So at least for the experiment that I ran for the VR versus the photographs, it was an easy double the time. So they spent twice wow. as much time in the VR tour as they did just looking through the photographs. You know, and I gave them a prompt of, you have a roommate, you're trying to find an apartment, make sure that there's enough space. Well, they would spend twice as much time in the tour and the, the 3D tour as they would the photographs. Okay, that's awesome. Okay, so so Kelly, I'm gonna I'm gonna switch it switch it all for you. You know, you have been you actually were into marketing, right? That was your that was your original thing. And then you decided, you know, I want to do some some real work. I can't be marketing all the time. Um, and so you go to the academics and so now I'm going to take you back into marketing and say, forget that you you did the research, right? Say you were given someone else's research that looked like yours, and you had to market this to your customer. How would you? How would you? You know, I don't know if you have thought about this, and this is you know we haven't discussed this question before, so I wanted to kind of put you on the spot because you know uh, it would be interesting for me to understand because a lot of people here are trying to market their 360 virtual tour service to their customers and someone like yourself that knows the data now, you know the data really well, and you have a marketing background, how would you kind of uh, put it all together if you, if you could kind of use that? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, and I think, you know, I'll go back to the, the marketing hat of you have to be consumer oriented. So it depends on your consumer. Um, who is your customer that you're trying to pitch to or your lead or your prospect? If it's a real estate agent, well, actually selling it in the way of, hey, your commission dollars are going to potentially go faster because we see some at least early evidence that in days of market that it can slightly decrease it and then the, it can increase the purchase price, which will offset the cost of the marketing. Um, if you're trying to sell to a seller, well, it increases the purchase price. You're trying to sell it to somebody who actually is buying the product that's different right so you know that type of pitch won't work for that type of individual so keeping that in mind of course if i'm trying to sell it i guess give me another consumer group that might be in of an interest to you uh, I, I think for me uh i, I think education like uh, universities mm -hmm. yeah and there is some of that happening right i see yep. is it you 
YouTube. Yes. And, um, and that is a great opportunity, especially now. And you hate to, to be opportunistic, but right now, individuals do need access to spaces. So that is the way to get in of let me document your space. It will allow you or your pro prospect or potential students to see the university, to be able to grow attached to the university when they can't be here physically. So actually enabling some of that emotional attachment could be beneficial um, while also recognizing that they do become more engaged with the content, right? It does, they spend double the time on, with um, this type of technology versus just photographs or even videos because they can have control over it. So that kind of selling point would actually be more valuable for them. Now we've talked a little bit about in the past on, um, you know, actual uh, what, curriculum, right? So when you're thinking yeah. from a curriculum standpoint in education, there are some amazing statistics that just came out. Um, Arizona State just uh, tested this in biology. They saw learning increase by fourfold because they could be engaged in this in a different way. They owned their experience in learning, which as an educator ultimately is what they want, right? So that the the student actually feels like they have ownership over their learning experience. If they're more engaged, their learning will increase. And so this type of technology can facilitate that as well. Awesome, yeah, that makes sense. Um, all right, I, I, think, uh, I think we're kind of at the end of, uh, end of our thing and uh, I'm gonna see if we missed out on any questions that could be interesting. Um, I don't find have something? A no, I was just thinking I don't have a way to add into the chat, but I will send um, the Kelly Quarters Anderson.com is my website, and you'll see a research tab there, and that can give you more information. And if you have any other questions following that, feel free to reach out. I love talking about this. Uh, so <laughs> do anytime. Okay, so I think Victor has a question. How much is there a focus on marketing, especially social media? in order to gain attention of non-users uh, and we are at 316 general. Uh, I'm not sure what, what the question really means, but um, I, to get attention. I think you're thinking more from an integrated marketing standpoint, right, Victor, of how can we bring to light the technology so it can be used by non-users because not everyone has been exposed to this type of technology. Um, and I do think social media is a good outlet for that. Um, it depends on the context or the vertical that you're in. Um, a, lot, a lot of times, I, I, I haven't done enough research, I probably should, into real estate using social media. I know that's a hot trend right now. The potential capability of that, um, I'm not familiar with, but it does seem like it would be a good medium to get that out there. The bigger thing, um, more than anything in real estate, would be just stitching in with that localized um, listing service or having it on a uh, website page. So again, going to an integrated standpoint, you know, when you have a sign in the front of the yard, it's not about selling the agent, right? And a lot of agents have a hard time with this, but it's about selling the home. Oh, yeah. Yes. So the more that you can actually sell the home on that listing with, of course, a little bit of information about the agent, but even having maybe a QR code that can allow them to land on that landing page for the home where it has the VR tour where they can visit it before actually coming in. Thinking about it from an integrated fashion is the right way of thinking, though, Victor. Got it. Uh, Luis has another question about do you know the percentage of real estate listings? Not in all of the United States, but at least for the markets that I'm doing research in, it's anywhere from two to 5%. And that was as of 2019. We just got data for 2020 on one of the markets so we can do more of a natural experiment and see what the pandemic actually did um, in at least one singular market, but it's still pretty small. There's a, there's still a lot of- There's a huge, yeah, huge, huge uh, market still, even in just real estate. and. Uh, you know, we work with Zillow and, and they tell us that, you know, that even though they keep pushing the 360 tours, it's still at like a 5%, 5% to 10%. And some of us in our in the group and, you know, even in our space of uh, selling software, we always say real estate is the worst 
uh, most competitive uh, space because there just seems to be everybody seems to be viewing virtual tours, but that's not really the case. There, there are ninety percent of the market does not use virtual tours, and I think that that itself is kind of a an indication of how much there is to to give. And I think you know the more we talk about these numbers, which you, which you talked about, which is you know four to eight percent increase in sales price uh, for real estate, I think that would just kind of you know people go where the money goes. So I think that. Things like this uh, would really help. Uh, I should have posted all of this in the real estate form. All right. Well, <laughs> I think so. Just to and and we all have to be conscious of you know we're getting that four to eight percent right now because it is so small. So keeping in mind, once we get to that fifty percent range, like video is at right now, it's going to create you know some of those numbers are going to decrease. But what it's going to do is it's going to create consumers' expectations for that over the video right so then you have to have the vr tour the 3d tour but there's other issues right that we have in real estate such as calling it a virtual tour so i'm right now cleaning um a new <laughs> right yeah every, everything's a virtual tour yeah, yeah, yeah everything's a virtual tour even if it's a photo, photo slide yep, yep. so it's that's a big challenge in this market because real estate agents don't know what this technology is. At least that's what I've heard in my qualitative interviews that they haven't, they don't understand the difference between a 3D tour and a video, or even in some regards, the video with just the slider photographs, right? They, to them, it means the same thing. So a lot of it does have to come down to education in a, good way to really snag those real estate agents and get them on board. Awesome. That, that is really cool information. Uh, so Kelly, I think, I think we're kind of at the end of our, of, of our conversation here. And I would really like to, uh, someone says virtual tour has been hijacked for sure. For <laughs> sure. Uh, wanted to really kind of thank you for your time. Uh, you know, I would love to, you know, if, if, uh, if we have more information and maybe somewhere down the line, I would love to invite you again. Uh, for everybody listening, what I'm gonna do is, uh, if you go to the event uh, uh, description, I put your I put your uh, email there. Sorry, your website there, and people can contact you if they want more information. Uh, what I'll also do is I'll sit down with you maybe next week or the week after that to create kind of an infographic uh, so that you know when we when I actually publish this to YouTube, so this video is gonna probably go on YouTube. Uh, uh, we can kind of put in those links, put links for your research. And I read your paper. I, I think the methodology that you have employed is really cool. Uh, you've used big data, which is really cool. Uh, it's, uh, it, it actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, and the MLS data is structured enough where it's not messy data. So, you know, so I think the methodology is kind of, you know, I mean, structured enough. That's why I said structured <laughs> enough. Yeah, comparatively. Yes, comparatively <laughs> right? uh, so I think the methodology definitely makes sense. Uh, I think what would be interesting is kind of looking at different uh, market segments. Uh, I feel construction is a market segment where uh, where there is massive value uh, that can be unlocked and tapped. And uh, I think, you know, some, somewhere there we could have a conversation on that. Uh, okay, people keep saying... Um, Paper link. Uh, I'll, I'll, everything is in the event description. Uh, uh, but Kelly, do you want to just spell out your your website? Because I don't know if I can put it here. Maybe I can. I know. I, I was just looking to see if I could pop it in the chat, but I can't. It's uh, KellyCoursAnderson.com. So that's K-E-L-L-E-Y-C-O-U-R-S is in Sam. Anderson there, A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N.com. And you'll find all sort of more information than you want, but there's a research tab that gives more detail on the research. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I think that's it for, 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 for this week. Uh, thanks a lot, Kelly, for your time. I'm going to put you off air. Just stay there, and I'm going to kind of like wrap it up in a nice bow, and then I'll, I'll meet you off stage. Thank right. you so much for the for inviting me it's been fun i mean no i mean your research is amazing so uh thank you very much all right mm -hmm. bye-bye all right uh thank you everybody for for sticking up uh so long uh and uh, this was the second week uh for our live interview series uh we have a a uh, a interview every week planned uh, i planned it up up to March, so I think 
you know, I'm going to kind of keep it on for about a year or two. Uh, if you are interested in uh, knowing of the next uh, the next talks, uh, follow Teleport Me Virtual Tours page because that's the easiest way to do it because uh, in the group, some are private, some are public, so it's really difficult to, to kind of get the information out to everybody. Um, and yeah, I mean, uh, thanks a lot and uh, keep the questions rolling. If, if you ever want, uh, go to Kelly's website. Uh, she has a lot of great information. Uh, and uh, I, wanna, I wanna shout out thanks to Mick Tai from 360rumors.com who, who kind of, you know, kind of let me do this with him. So I think that, you know, and also uh, a shout out to Atlee Joseph who let me uh, use this software because last time was a little bit tricky because uh, I kind of messed up a little bit with the audio and all of that stuff. So, uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks a lot, guys. And, and I hope to see you next week with another live session. If you're interested in knowing what it is, definitely follow Teleport Me Virtual Tours. I'm gonna to try to spam all the groups, but I can't. I can't really, really uh, say who's gonna see it. So, see you, everybody. Bye bye.